Hi, I'm Hayley Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, I'm going to be discussing the much anticipated and requested subject that is fraud. Now, I appreciate that fraud is, well, the most commonly experienced crime in the UK at the moment is fraud and it's got a massive impact on a lot of things. So not only can it um, impact individuals when you've had money and stuff taken from you or you've suffered a loss because of somebody else's actions, which we'll discuss in a minute. It can also put businesses out of business and um, unaffordable losses, both personal and business, which can devastate people's livelihoods and lives. It's a massive offence and it happens a lot. And as such, it's going to take us a little time to unpick it all because there are certain sections and subsections um, under this massive umbrella of fraud. Okay, so the Fraud Act 2006 is... Um, like I said, a massive bit of legislation. I'm going to break it down bit by bit for you. Fraud itself is tribal either way, which means depending on the severity of the offence you've done, you could end up at the Crown Court or the Magistrates. So if it's super bad, you'd be at the Crown. Not so bad, you'd be at the Magistrates. You remember that? You could look at up to 10 years in prison uh, if you're looking at the higher end and 12 months at the lower end and or a fine. Uh, either of those can get a fine on both of those levels. And like I said, it does depend on what you've done and any aggravating or mitigating factors in those cases. Without further ado, let's start looking at the legislation. I'm reading this legislation straight from Blackstone's Policing Handbook. And that's because it's really good in terms of, you know, the level of detail and the language it uses. There's still gonna be quite a lot of bump and legal jargon, but I'm gonna break it down for you as well. The Fraud Act itself breaks down um, fraud into three main categories of offence, which are fraud by false representation, fraud by failing to disclose information, and uh, fraud by abuse of position. So they're the three main categories we're going to look at today. And I'm going to give you some examples in there too, to help you differentiate between each one of those. Things evolve all the time. In terms of crime, criminals are quite clever sometimes. And I know we get some very daft ones too, but quite clever as well, especially with crimes like fraud and things like that. They can be one step ahead and you've got to really, really um, keep your wits about you to not become a victim of these offences. So, I mean, the other day I had a text message from the Royal Mail. Yeah, of course I did. Um, saying that I'd missed a parcel and I had to pay for redelivery, all this kind of stuff. Well, I've not ordered anything for a start. And they text me at 6am on a Saturday. I'm thinking, I don't think that's accurate, but good try. And from like a mobile phone number. You've just got to keep your wits about you and make sure that you, if you are uncertain about something or something doesn't quite add up, that you do a little bit of investigating and stuff first before you give anybody any money. Never give anybody any money <laughs> over text messages, okay? It's, it's not right. And if in doubt, phone the real numbers. And there's plenty of advice on the websites and stuff as well. So as soon as I got that text message from the pretend Royal Mail, I went on the Royal Mail website and reported where it came from so they can take it up and make sure that nobody else has these messages or that nobody actually believes them in parts with any money or personal details. Okay, so fraud. Uh, fraud Act 2006, Section 1. I'm going to read that for you now. And then it says here, so... A person is guilty of fraud if he is in breach of any of the sections listed in subsection 2. I kind of just said what they are, but I'll go for it properly. Uh, which provide for different ways of committing the offence. So these sections are, section 2 is fraud by false representation. Section 3 is fraud by failing to disclose information. And section 4 is fraud by abuse of position. They are sections of fraud. We'll start off with fraud by false representation. Now, the legislation for this itself is quite wordy, but if you skim past all the bum, you get to the point, it's actually kind of easy. So, a person is in breach of this section, so section two of the Fraud Act, if he dishonestly makes a false representation, remember that word dishonestly, because we're going to pick that apart in a minute, and intends by making a representation to make a gain for himself or another, or to cause loss to another or expose another to the risk of loss. Okay. A representation is false if it is untrue or misleading and the person making it knows that it is or might be untrue or misleading. Representation means any representation 
as to fact or law, including a representation as to the state of mind of the person making the representation. How many times have I said that word? Or any other person. It goes on. And I'm reading the Blackstone's policing uh, manual, the new one. There you go. <laughs> Section four. So subsection four of section two of the Fraud Act says a representation may be expressed or implied. And subsection five. For the purpose of this section, a representation may be regarded as made if it, or anything implying it is, is submitted in any form to any system or device designed to receive, convey, or to respond to communications with or without human intervention. So think back to my post office text message. Ugh, definitely wasn't post office. Okay. So I mentioned the word dishonest and dishonestly. And when we're looking at fraud, there's a saying that people say, which is um, the man on the Clapham omnibus. I don't know if you've heard that before. Apparently the Clapham omnibus is like, I don't know, a bus back in Clapham in the olden days. What it means though, is it would a regular person find that action that someone's done is dishonest. That's basically what it means. And there is a case, which is RV Ghosh, um, which underpins all this now Ghosh was a doctor and he was working as a locum doctor and was claiming for work he hadn't done from the NHS that other people had completed and in court he was like saying oh well no I wasn't being dishonest but then they put this test in which was you know would a, would a rational person of sound mind think that that was dishonest behavior and the answer was yes and then his appeal was like because, you know, you, you're being dishonest. There you go. There's more on that as well. Anyway, so representation is false if it's untrue or misleading, obviously. And the person making it knows or knows it might be the case. So it's misleading someone. You're being a tricksy little hobbit, okay? So a representation may be implied by conduct. So it could maybe I am... Um, so the actions that someone's doing. If I've got a credit card, right... And it's not mine, but I take it to a shop and don't say anything, just hand it over and pay for the goods and leave. That's false representation because I'm pretending that person, that card, that thing is mine to get something and it's not. So the representation may be expressed or implied. There's, there's no um, limitation on how this could be done. It could be done by text message, letter, email, in person. If you think about, well, just... <sighs> So think about false representation like through the post then. If you get a letter that's fraudulent or an email, I mean, you don't have to have been decepted by that. Once that has been sent, the fraud, um, offence of fraud has been committed. Okay, so that's fraud by false representation. Hope that makes sense. So you're pretending, you're misleading somebody or you know it's misleading and the person making representation knows or thinks it might be. Simple, right? Um, okay, so yeah, that's false representation for by false representation done. So section three of the Fraud Act 2006 is when you commit a fraud by failing to disclose information. Now then, I wonder how many people out there have fibbed on their CVs and job interviews and things like that. Or maybe it's asking you to disclose whether you've got any criminal convictions or anything else like that, and you've failed to disclose. Hmm. Let's have a look at this one, shall we? So a person is in breach of this section if he dishonestly fails to disclose to another person information which he is under legal duty to disclose and intends by failing to disclose the information, make a gain for himself or another, or to cause loss to another or expose another to risk of loss. Okay, that's a big one, isn't it? So... It creates an offence of dishonesty failing to disclose information where there's a legal duty to do so. A simple description of this one would be, um, think about life insurance. If you fail to disclose that you've got a serious heart condition and to count life insurance, um, you're supposed to legally declare that kind of thing because it affects your premium and stuff like that. And if you haven't, then that could be fraud by failing to disclose information. Okay, so this is my favourite one in terms of ease to describe. So section four of the Fraud Act 2006 is all about fraud by abuse of position. Now let me just read the legislation straight from the book for you. It states a person is in breach of this section if he occupies a position in which he's expected to safeguard or not to act against the financial interest of another person, dishonestly abuses that position 
and intends by means of another abuse of that position to make a gain for himself or another. Again, it's all about gain, isn't it? Or cause a loss to another or expose another to risk of loss. A person may be regarded as having abused his position, even though his conduct consisted of an omission rather than an act. Now, an omission means you could have done something to stop it happening, but you didn't. You omitted to act. You didn't act when you could have. Naughty. Okay, so let's talk about some examples there then. So abuse of position. Hmm. I wonder if you've heard that before in, in other offences. So abusing that position of power, the position that you're in to get a loss, for you, a gain for yourself or another, or to expose someone to a loss or risk of loss. If you're an employee, for example, in a software company, then you clone that software um, and sell the products on, then you're abusing your position there. Okay. If another example in the Blackstone's book actually was about um, an employee fails to take up the chance of a crucial contract in order that an associate or rival company can take it up instead of and at the expense of an employer. OK, and also if you think about um, an estate agent. So you're an estate agent and there's a house. Um, there's like a, 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 an elderly person who has a house and you value it at a daft price, like really low price, because you know that you might want to buy it or your brother might want to buy it. So you value it low, they sell the house, and that person gets a bargain house, so they get a gain from that, and you've also put the other person at a loss. In sections two, three, and four of the Fraud Act, there are some words and phrases that I mentioned a lot. So I talked about gain and loss. So let me unpick those a little bit for you now. They sit under section five of the Fraud Act. That's really handy, isn't it? So I'll read that out again so you know you're getting the actual information you need. So the references to gain and loss in sections two to four are to be read in accordance with this section. Gain and loss. Extend only to gain and loss in money or other property. Include any such gain or loss, whether temporary or permanent. And property means any property, whether real or personal, including things in action and other intangible property. Gain includes a gain by keeping what one has, as well as getting what one does not have. What about if, let's put my nerd hat on. Okay, um, if you have a signed copy of... I don't know, a hardback of Harry Potter book one or something, if they're still worth loads of money. And then you keep it and you swap it and give somebody um, a, a 2022 release version of it and doodle a signature in it yourself. You're committing fraud there, aren't you? Because you are keeping what you have. It loss includes a loss by not getting what one might get as well as a loss by parting with what one has. So if you look at the example of that house we talked about, if I'm selling my house and someone values it really low, that I don't get as much money as I would from the sale, then I'm not getting what I might get. Okay? So really, that's not actually that difficult, is it? So in terms of fraud then, those three main categories I spoke about so section one of fraud just talks about those three offences, basically, and the specifics. So you've got section two, which is fraud by false representation. And remember, we talked about um, those text messages, phishing and stuff like that, or using um, somebody else's credit card with their name on. You just don't tell someone the cashier it's not yours. You just pretend that it's you. Hey, it's me. It's not, is it, you little liar? Uh, fraud by failing to disclose. So let's look again at life insurance. You've got to tell them do you smoke and stuff like that. You're like, no, nah, I don't smoke. Even though you smoke 20 a day. Then you make a claim on that. That's fraud by um, failing to disclose. And then you've got fraud by abuse of position. So then think about perhaps those estate agents I mentioned or a carer who was entrusted with people's finances taking that money for themselves, causing a loss to somebody else and causing a gain for you. That's fraud in a little bit of a nutshell. Remember when we're looking at dishonesty, we're looking at RV Ghosh, and that's the doctor who had pretended they'd done more work than they had, claimed other people's work to get more money from the NHS. 
and that was um, how they describe dishonesty. You might also hear it as a man on the clap and omnibus, and that's all about if a rational, normal person, your everyday, run-of-the-mill person, would find that dishonest, then it is dishonest. That's it. I hope it makes sense. If you want any more uh, about fraud or anything like that, let me know. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for subscribing, guys. I really do appreciate it. And if you do like this video, please do subscribe, share it to your friends. And I've got a little competition going on as well. So it's proper ambitious, right? But if I get to a thousand subscribers, I'm going to buy one of you guys a uh, Blackstone's Policing Handbook and I will send it out to you as well. A brand new one, not one of my scruffy old ones or a second one or anything like that. Buy a brand new one and I'll send it on to you. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Please do subscribe. Um, stay safe, look after each other and please don't commit any crimes.